against the bear of Margarth, Ulfric Stormcloak. No, is not an answer. The Wild Elves by Kierjo Jorvak In the wilds of most every province of Tamriel, descended philosophically, if not directly, from the original inhabitants of the land, are the aliens, commonly called the Wild Elves. While three races of elven stock, the Altimer, or High Elves, the Bosmer, or Wood Elves, and the Dunmer, or Dark Elves, have assimilated well into the new cultures of Tamriel, the aliens and their brethren have remained aloof toward our civilization, preferring to practice the old ways far from the eyes of the world. The wild elves speak a variation of old Scylidilic, opting to shun Tamrielic and separate themselves from the mainstream of Tamriel even further than the least urbanized of their elven cousins. In temperament, they are dark-spirited and taciturn, although this is from the point of view of outsiders, or Palani in their tongue, and doubtless they act differently within their own tribes. Indeed, one of the finest sages of the University of Gwilym was a civilized alien elf, Shurhain Fire. First Era, 2790 to Second Era, 227, whose published work on wild elves suggests a lively, vibrant culture. Fiery is one of the very few aliens to speak freely on his people and religion, and he himself said, The nature of the alien tribes is multi-hued, their personalities often wildly different from their neighboring tribes. Fiery. Nature of a Lydilic Poesy. Poesy. P.S. University of Gwilym Press, Second Era, 12. Like any alien culture, wild elves are often feared by the simple people of Tamriel. The aliens continue to be one of the greatest enigmas of the continent of Tamriel. They seldom appear in the pages of written history in any role, and then only as a strange sight a chronicler stumbles upon before they vanish into the wood. When probable fiction is filtered from common legend, we are left with almost nothing. The mysterious ways of the aliens have remained shrouded since before the first era, and may well remain so for thousands of years to come. Fall of the Snow Prince an account of the Battle of the Mosring, as transcribed by Lochim, chronicler to the chief Dane, Ingalar, White Eye. From whence we, from whence he came, we did not know, but into the battle he rode on a brilliant steed of pallid white. Elf we called him, for elf he was, yet unlike any other of his kind we had ever seen before that day. His spear and armor bore the radiant and terrible glow of unknown magicka, and so adorned this unknown rider seemed more white than warrior. What, tro what troubled, nay, frightened most of us at that moment was the call that rose from the elven ranks. It was not fear, not wonder, but an unabashed and unbridled joy, the kind of felicity felt by a damned man who has been granted a second chance at life. For at that time the elves were as damned and near death as ever they had been during the great skirmishes of Solstheim. The battle of the Mose Ring was to be the final stand between Nord and Elf on our fair island. Led by Ysgrimor, we had driven the elven scourge from Skyrim and were intent on cleansing Solstheim of their kind as well. Our warriors, armed with the finest axes and swords Nord craftsmen could forge, cut great swaths through the enemy ranks. The slopes of the Mose Ring ran red with elf blood. Why, then, would our foe rejoice? Could one rider bring such hope to an army so hopeless? To most of our kind, the meaning of the call was clear, but the words were but a litany of elven chants and cries. There were some among us, however, 
scholars, and chroniclers who knew well the words and shuddered at their significance. The snow prince is come. Doom is at hand. There was a great calm that overcame the elves that still stood. Through their mass the snow prince did ride, and as a long boat slices through the icy waters of the Fjaldin, he parted the ranks of his kin. The magnificent white horses slowed to a gallop, then a trot, and the unknown elf rider moved to the front of the line at a slow, almost ghost-like pace. A Nord warrior sees much in a life of bloodshed and battle, and is rarely surprised by anything armed combat may bring, but few among us that day could have imagined the awe and uncertainty of a raging battlefield that all at once went motionless and silent. Such is the effect the Snow Prince had on us all, for when the joyous cries of the elves had ended, there remained a quiet known only in the solitude of slumber. It was then our combined host, elf and nord alike, were joined in a terrible understanding. Victory or defeat mattered little that day on the slopes of the Mosering Mountains. The one truth we all shared was that death would come to many that day, victor and vanquished alike. The glorious snow prince, an elf unlike any other, did come that day to bring death to our kind and death he so brought. Like a sudden, violent snow squall that rends travelers blind and threatens to tear loose the very foundations of the sturdiest hall, the snow prince did sweep into our numbers. Indeed, the ice and snow did begin to swirl and churn about the elf, as if called upon to serve his bidding. The spinning of that gleaming spear whistled a dirge to all those who would stand in the way of the snow prince and our mightiest fell before him that day. Ulfki Anvil Hand, Strom the White, Freda Oakenwand, Heimdall the Frenzied, all lay dead at the foot of the Mosring Mountains. For the first time that day, it seemed the tide of battle had actually turned. The elves, spurred on by the deeds of the Snow Prince, rallied together for one last charge against our ranks. It was then, in a single instant, that the battle of Mosring came to a sudden and unexpected end. Fina, daughter of Jovrior, a lass of only twelve years and squire to her mother, watched as the snow prince cut down her only parrot. In her rage, Fina picked up Jovrior's sword and threw it savagely at her mother's killer. When the elf's gleaming spear stopped its deadly dance, the battlefield fell silent and all eyes turned to the Snow Prince. No one that day was more surprised than the elf himself at the sight that greeted him all, for upon his great steed the Snow Prince still sat, the sword of Jofrior buried deeply in his breast, and then he fell from his horse, from the battle, from life. The Snow Prince lay dead, slain by a child. With their savior defeated, the spirit of the remaining elven warriors soon shattered. Many fled, and those that remained on the battlefield were soon cut down by our broad Nord axes. When the day was done, all that remained was the carnage of the battlefield, and from that battlefield came a din, dim reminder of valor and skill. For the brilliant armor and spear of the Snow Prince still shined. Even in death, this mighty and unknown elf filled us with awe. It is common practice to burn the corpses of our fallen foes. This is as much a necessity as it is custom, for death brings with it disease and dread. Our chieftains wish to cleanse Solstheim of the elven horde in death as well as life. It was decided, however, that such was not to be the fate of the Snow Prince, one so mighty in war yet so loved by his kin, deserved better, even in death, even if an enemy of our people. And so we brought the body of the Snow Prince, wrapped in fine silks, to a freshly dug barrow. The gleaming armor and spear were presented on a pedestal of honor, and the tomb was arrayed with treasures worthy of royalty. 
all of the mighty chieftains agreed with this course, that the elf should be so honored. His body would be preserved in the barrow for as long as the earth chose, but would not be offered the protection of our stall rib, which was reserved for nor dead alone. So ends his account of the battle of the Mos Ring and the fall of the magnificent elven snow prince. May our gods honor him in death, and may we never meet his kind again in life. The Dunmer of Skyrim by Athol Sarus. Dunmer, that is our name. Yet you deny us even this courtesy. You, the white skinned, jaundice haired apes of this god forsaken, frozen wilderness. To you, Nords, we are the gray ones, the ashen skinned, the dark elves of Morrowind, who have as much place in your land as an infection and an open wound. Oh, yes, we have read your great cultural work, Nords of Skyrim, in which you extol the many virtues of your people and province, and invite any visitors to come experience your homeland for themselves. Welcome we did, Nords, and the reception was less than was promised, but exactly what we expected. So I, a tall Ceres, Dunmer, an immigrant to Skyrim, have decided to answer your beloved book with a work of my own, and let all who read it know that Nords are not the only race to reside in this cold and inhospitable realm. For we dark elves have come, and little by little shall claim Skyrim as our own. But where, you may ask, have we taken up residence? Why, none other than the ancient city of Windhelm, once the capital of the First Empire. Yes, Nords in the shadow of your own palace of the kings, where the Nord hero Ysgrimor once held court. We now thrive. Oh yes, your beloved five hundred companions may have driven our ancestors from Skyrim, but that was then. This is now. Indeed, one might be surprised as to just how well we've settled into Windhelm. The district only known as the Snow Quarter is thus named no more. Now they call it the Grey Quarter, for such is the reality of the Dunmer occupation. The district is now populated entirely by my kind, a victory not lost on its residents. Oh, but the peaceful occupation goes even further. Thirsty, you'll find no Nord Mead Hall in the Great Quarter, but the spirits flow well enough in the new, nicest corner club. Seeking a respected family, you'll find no grey maids within these walls, but perhaps you'd like to pay a visit to the home of Belen Alalu, descendant of one of the most noble houses in all of Morrowind. Ah, but no, you Nords don't come to the Grey Quarter, do you? You fear our streets as you fear our skin. So now, children of Skyrim, you have the truth of it. You may call this province home, but you can no sooner claim to own it than a cow can claim to own its master's field. You are just another breed of domestic animal, grazing stupidly while higher beings plot your slaughter. Up next, we have some more information about the Dunmer. So let's finish reading the histories of the Dunmer here, and then we will we will finish our reading for today. Ancestors and the Dunmer, ghosts walk among them. The departed spirits of the Dunmeri, and perhaps those of all races, persist after death. The knowledge and power of departed ancestors benefits the bloodlines of the Dunmeri houses. The bond between the living family members and immortal ancestors is partly blood, partly ritual, partly volitional. A member brought into the house through marriage binds himself through ritual and oath into the clan, and gains communication and benefits from the clan's ancestors. However, his access to the ancestors is less than his offspring, and he retains some access to the ancestors of his own bloodline. The Family Shrine Each residence has a family shrine. In poorer homes, it may be no more than a hearth or alcove where family relics are displayed and venerated. In wealthy homes, a room is set aside for the use of the ancestors. This shrine is called the Waiting Door, and represents the door to oblivion. 
Here the family members pay their respects to their ancestors through sacrifice and prayer, through oaths sworn upon duties, and through reports on the affairs of the family. In return, the family may receive information, training, and blessings from the family's ancestors. The ancestors are thus the protectors of the home, and especially the precincts of the waiting door. The Ghost Fence It is a family's most solemn duty to make sure their ancestors' remains are interred properly in a city of the dead, such as Necrom. Here the spirits draw comfort from one another against the chill of the moral world. However, as a sign of great honor and sacrifice, an ancestor may grant that part of his remains be retained to serve as part of a ghost fence protecting the clan shrine and family precincts. Such an arrangement is often part of the family member's will that a knuckle bone shall be, shaved, shall be saved out of his remains and incorporated with solemn magic and ceremony into a clan ghost fence. In more exceptional cases, an entire skeleton, or even a preserved corpse, may be bound into a ghost fence. These remains become a beacon and focus for ancestral spirits, and for the spirit of the remains in particular. The move remains used to make a ghost fence. The more powerful the fence is, and the most powerful mortals in life have the most powerful remains. The great ghost fence, created by the tribunal to hold back the blight, incorporates the bones of many heroes of the temple and of the houses in Doril and Redoran, who dedicate their spirits to the temple and clan as their surrogate families. The ghost fence also contains bones taken from the catacombs of Necrom and the many battlefields of Morrowind. The Mortal Chill Spirits do not like to visit the mortal world, and they do so only out of duty and obligation. Spirits tell us that the other world is more pleasant, or at least more comfortable for spirits, than our real world, which is cold, bitter, and full of pain and loss. Mad Spirits Spirits that are forced to remain in our world against their will may become mad spirits or ghosts. Some spirits are bound to this world because of some terrible circumstances of their death, or because of some powerful emotional bond to a person, place, or thing. These are called hauntings. Some spirits are captured and bound to enchanted items by wizards. If the binding is, is involuntary, the spirit usually goes mad. A willing spirit may or may not retain its sanity, depending on the strength of the spirit and the wisdom of the enchanter. Some spirits are bound against their wills to protect family shrines. This unpleasant fate is reserved for those who have not served the family faithfully in life. Dutiful and honorable ancestral spirits often aid in the capture and binding of wayward spirits. These spirits usually go mad and make terrifying guardians. They are ritually prevented from harming morals of their clans, but that does not necessarily discourage them from the mischievous or peevish behavior. They are exceedingly dangerous for intruders. At the same time, if an intruder can penetrate the spirit's madness and play upon the spirit's resentment for his own clan, the angry spirits may be manipulated. Oblivion The existence of oblivion is acknowledged by all Damriel cultures, but there is little agreement on the nature of that other world other than it is the place where the Adra and Daedra live and that communication and travel are possible between this world and oblivion through magic and ritual. The Dunmer do not emphasize the distinction between this world and oblivion as do the human cultures of Damriel. They regard our world and the other world as a whole, with many paths from one end to the other, rather than two separate worlds of different natures with distinct borders. This philosophical viewpoint may account for the greater affinity of elves for magic and its practices. Foreign Views of Dunmary Ancestor Worship and Spirit Magic The Altmeri and Bosmeri cultures also venerate their ancestors, but only by respecting the orderly and blissful passage of these spirits from this world to the next. That is, Wood Elves and High Elves believes it is cruel and unnatural to encourage the spirits of the dead to linger in our world. Even more grotesque and repugnant is a display of the bodily remains of ancestors.
ancestors in ghost fences and ash pits. The presentation of finger bones in a family shrine, for example, is sacrilegious to the Bosmer who eat their dead, and barbaric to the Altimer who endure their dead. The human cultures of Damriel are ignorant and fearful of dark elves and their culture, considering them to be inhuman and evil, like orcs and Argonians, but more sophisticated. The human populations of Damriel associate Dunmary ancestor worship and spirit magic with necromancy. In fact, this association of the dark elves with necromancy is at least partly responsible for the dark reputation of Dunmer throughout Damriel. This is generally an ignorant misconception for necromancy outside the acceptable clan rituals. It's a most abhorrent abomination in the eyes of the Dunmer. The Dark Elves would never think of practicing sorcerous necromancy upon any Dark Elf or upon the remains of any Elf. However, Dark Elves consider the human and orcish races to be little more than animals. There is no injunction against necromancy upon such remains or on the remains of any animal, bird, or insect. Imperial policy officially recognizes the practices of Dunmary ancestor veneration and spirit magic as a religion, and protects their freedom to pursue such practices so long as they do not threaten the security of the Empire. Privately, most Imperial officials and traitors believe dark elf ancestor worship and displays of remains of barbaric or even necromantic. Telvanni Necromancy The Telvanni are adept masters of necromancy. They do not, however, practice necromancy upon the remains of dark elves. Sane Telvanni regard such practices with loathing and righteous anger. They do practice necromancy upon the remains of animals and upon the remains of humans, orcs, and Argonians, who are technically no more than animals in Morrowind. This book was written by an unknown scholar as a guide for foreign visitors to Morrowind shortly after the armistice was signed. Many of these practices have since fallen into disfavor. The most obvious changes are those regarding the practice of necromancy and the great ghost fence. Dunmer today regard necromancy upon any of the accepted races as an abomination. The ghost fence has forced many changes in the practice of ancestor worship, with the vast majority of ancestors' remains going to strengthen the great ghost fence around the mountain of Dagoth Ur. There are very few ghost fences in Morrowind. The temple discourages such practices among the houses as selfish. The upkeep of family tombs and private waiting doors has also fallen into disfavor, as very few remains have been buried in these tombs and shrines since the armistice. In recent years, most Dunmer venerate a small portion of their ancestors' remains kept at a local temple. Confessions of a Dunmer Skuma Eater Nothing is more revolting to Dunmer feeling than the sorry spectacle of another Dunmer, enslaved by that derivative moon sugar known as skooma, and nothing is le less appetizing than listening to the pathetic tales of humiliation and degradation associated with a victim of this addictive drug. Why, then, do I force myself upon you with this extended and detailed account of my sins and sorrows? because I hope that by telling my tale the hope of my redemption from this sorry state shall be more widely known, and because I hope that others who may have also fallen into the sorry state of skooma addiction may therefore hear of my story, of how I fell into despair, and how I once again found myself and freed myself from my own self-imposing chains. Because it is widely known to all Khajiit who may be expected to know that there is no cure for addiction to skooma, that once a slave to skooma, always a slave to skooma. Because this is widely known, it is taken to be true, but it is not true, and I am living proof. There is no miracle cure, there is no potion to be taken, there is no magical incantation which frees you from the thrill of skooma running through your blood, but it is through the understanding of that thrill, and the acceptance of the lust within oneself for that thrill, and the casting aside of the shame that the thrill-seeker feels 
when he cannot set aside what becomes in the end his only comfort and pleasure it is through this knowledge and understanding that the victim comes to the place where choices may be made or despair and hope may be separated in short only knowledge and acceptance can deliver into the slave's hands the key that opens his shackles and sets him free all right so that is all i'm going to read today in the next episode we'll be reading children of the all maker and continuing on through this book i hope you have all enjoyed the readings thus far on the nords and the dark elves it's certainly been interesting reading these histories of the races of skyrim i hope you've been enjoying as well let me know what you thought of this video watch the previous one if you have not and stay tuned for more thank you for watching and i hope that you are relaxed